Spray Tips with Tom Wolf is brought to you by Loveland Products and All Clear, the premium spray tank cleaner. Don't let spray tank residue lose you. The results are all clear. Hello and welcome to Spray Tips with Tom. Uh, this week we had a great question uh, from uh, a client on by email and the, the question was, uh, I'm considering purchasing a new sprayer. I have the choice of going to a plastic or a steel tank. Which one should I choose? Uh, I spent some time uh, reviewing our results with clean out uh, of various products and uh, shared that in some tests when we compared steel to plastic, steel was indeed a little easier to clean than plastic. Not speaking against plastic, you can clean it thoroughly, but it probably will take a little more time, an extra rinse perhaps. And so just from a productivity perspective, I advise the client to consider steel. Uh, you'll have less downtime and as a result, maybe get more acres sprayed and have a little bit less worry about, about residue. Same really goes for uh, boom components. Uh, we're seeing a resurgence of uh, steel boom components and I think the same rule applies, easier to clean out. We'll talk a little bit more detail in that later. What we want to do this week is a recap some of the observations we had from the last season, some of the past episodes of this program. And I want to start with uh, burn-off. Uh, at the beginning of the season, we talked about uh, water volume uh, tank mixes uh, with burn-off. As you know, in most situations now, the, the days of spraying glyphosate by itself as a burn-off product are probably behind us. And that's primarily because of uh, difficult to control weeds and volunteers, glyphosate resistant weeds and Roundup Ready volunteers. We're tank mixing typically with a contact product now. In Western Canada, we're seeing uh, heat, uh, carfentrazone, those are both group 14 products. Also, bromoxanol, group 6 products. All of them are contact and they require higher water volumes to work well. So, for burn off now, we have to focus on that aspect. If we do that, um, then we have to start watching water quality, and that's the, the second topic. And that really refers now to uh, hardness. Uh, glyphosate is sensitive to hardness, and some other products are as well. And we need to know what that hardness is because we may need to correct for that. When we add more water to the tank mix, uh, we are really increasing the effect that water quality can have on the herbicide. Um, let's test that water. If you have surface water, uh, probably you will be a little softer than you than if you are using ground or, or well water. And uh, if you, uh, but nonetheless, you should test it. Hardness. 350 parts per million or less, probably okay for glyphosate. Um, divide that number by 17 and you will get grains, uh, which is a unit some water testing labs report. So about, uh, about 20 grains or so uh, should, be, should be about right. Above that, you will need to consider using uh, a, a water softener such as ammonium sulfate. Ammonium sulfate uh, ties up the hard water cations and uh, helps the, the herbicide be absorbed more easily. So that's the, the strategy, do test your water if in question and uh, perhaps consider using uh, you know, a different water source and so on and so forth. Higher glyphosate rates, obviously the higher threshold for that hardness. Um, the third uh, topic we talked about in the past season was nozzle selection. Now this is a big one and we had a, a couple episodes on it. Uh, and I'm not very dogmatic about which nozzle you should be using. I want to talk about spray quality. You know, fine, medium, coarse, very coarse, international standard that's now being reported by all nozzle manufacturers. With a bit of time, you should be able to find the spray quality of the nozzle you're considering online in those manufacturers' catalogs or websites. Um, aim for the coarse spray quality as a very good starting point and make sure the nozzle you're considering gives you a coarse spray at a higher pressure as well. The main reason for that is we like to elevate the pressure of our air induction and pre orifice tips slightly so that we have more travel speed range. In other words, uh, you should be looking for a, a coarse spray in the middle of the operating range of the, of the pressure of that nozzle. So if a nozzle has a 30 to 100 psi pressure range, which is quite common, then you should be about at 70 percent or so, uh, 70 psi or so. And then you have some room to move to slow down, for example, without losing an efficacious kind of spray quality. So do look that up. Your, your manufacturers, your dealers uh, should have that information for you. We talked a fair bit about double nozzles. Uh, double nozzles uh, are very popular and will continue to be. I see two main reasons for going to double nozzles. The first one is if you have fusarium head blight. 
the twin fan type spray does target the head more effectively and we've shown that. Uh, if you do use a twin fan for that purpose, a slightly coarser spray is essential to make sure that the droplets actually retain their direction well all the way to the target. Otherwise, the wind speed, travel speed will deflect those droplets and will, they'll just move in whichever direction the wind blows. So a little coarser and a lower boom is essential here. The second reason for using a, a twin fan nozzle is to affect your droplet size a little bit. Let's say, for example, you have a very high flow need and an 06 or an 08 nozzle. And as the nozzles, as you know, the higher the flow, nominal flow, the coarser they typically get. You can mitigate that somewhat by going to a split and using two lower flow rate nozzles and, and getting a slightly finer spray as a result. That's very important if you have coverage considerations and the, the, the twin fans are, are very useful for that. The finer you go with a twin fan though, the less effective it's gonna be in actually targeting the spray forward and backward for the reasons I mentioned just a minute ago. Uh, the fifth topic is cleanup. We already touched on that a little bit and really what we talked about was look beyond the tank. Uh, the tank is an important part for clean out, uh, but your booms, uh, your boom ends, and your screens, your plumbing, very important as well. The plumbing, significant distance, significant surface area in that distance, and usually a rubber type compound. So we, we don't see it, we don't see what's going on, so you have to be quite diligent in getting through it. Inspect your screens, make sure you're not more than, uh, not finer than 50 mesh. Uh, if you have a dry product, a stound, sulfonyureas, those kinds of dry products do need hydration time and they do need a little bit of a larger screen. Uh, boom ends, uh, we have the express nozzle body end cap as an innovation, uh, very useful uh, for making sure your boom ends stay clean. Otherwise, an open, uh, a valve uh, on that boom end uh, is essential. So those are some of the highlights we covered. Uh, I want to talk briefly about productivity. Uh, everyone needs to cover more acres, there's less time, windows are narrow, um, weather conditions change constantly. And the, the easiest way to, to increase your productivity is of course to drive a little faster. I'm not a big fan of that solution, I recognize its importance, but the reason I don't love it is because it, the, the faster travel speed opens you up to problems. You have to have a slightly higher boom height, your pressure fluctuations are greater when you slow down. Um, and you, you probably have more drift and, and you have more difficulty penetrating the canopy. You're probably generating a little bit more dust as well. So I'm not loving speed as a, as a, as a, as a practice. So let's consider uh, going otherwise. You know, let's talk about boom width. Let's talk about reduction of downtime for, during filling or even cleaning like I mentioned earlier. Think about the whole package and what proportion of time you're actually spraying. That greatly affects your acres per hour. And so I, I want to think outside the box a little bit. Uh, seeing a lot of activity on Twitter these days with guys uh, saying, you know, this winter I'm going to convert my transfer system to a three inch system. And uh, you can spin weld a three inch fitting onto your tank if you need to. It's, it's entirely possible if you have a plastic tank or, or do some other, other retrofit. But certainly the transfer pump and all that, if it's a three inch, you will gain serious gallons per minute on that. Do make sure if you have a dry product, you give enough time for hydration. Uh, finally, we talked about aerial application, uh, and uh, aerial application is an important tool in the spray business. Uh, I would not hesitate to recommend an airplane for a fungicide or other application. The important thing, remember, agronomically speaking, is to be timely. Do what you need to do to be on time. But do have that conversation with your aerial applicator about the water volume that they are intending to use. Uh, if you if you're, uh, see a large discrepancy with water volume uh, and the label statements, talk about what kinds of uh, inducements you need uh, to give to to have a little bit more water applied you know it might be a few dollars per acre and it might be worth it uh, for, from your end and maybe also consult with your your chemical rep on that about very question i think we should be moving away from the one to two gallon per acre aerial application and moving more toward a three four and even five gallon per acre application depending on the canopy that you're targeting and depending on the disease you have to get so do talk to your your cost, uh, your uh, manufacturer's rep about that um, that's a quick recap of what we talked about uh, this past season. Um, you can go back to these episodes uh, online on at realagriculture.com to see them in, in more detail. Um, and hopefully uh, we'll, we'll see you uh, with more new topics in, uh, in 2015.